So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we are going to be talking about game design. I have to say I'm not a huge fan of gamification, and if you would like at the Q&A, if I haven't covered uh, the reasons uh, I find gamification a bit suspect, I'm happy to cover that. Um, but, uh, and if you wanted to tweet or follow me or stalk me or read more about me, I'm at C. Woodkey. If you can spell my last name, basically you can find me anywhere. It's, it's, I'm pretty much the Woodkey on the internet right now. There's a small bit uh, guy, Mark Woodkey, in Hollywood that's starting to get some traction, but it hasn't really happened yet, so I still own it. Um, so, I don't really have New Year's resolutions. I don't like New Year's resolutions. When you make a resolution at New Year's, um, by the end of January you feel guilty and nothing's really changed. What I do instead is every year I have a New Year's project. So one year it was beauty. I always pick something that I think is essentially human that I don't really understand. So I was raised by hippies and my parents, uh, my parents taught me um, nothing about makeup or clothing or bras or anything. You know, I learned how to cook, I learned how to garden, I learned stuff like that. And so uh, a few years back I said, okay, what is all this business? I found a spa that taught me how to put on makeup. I found a personal uh, stylist. As you can see, some of it took, some of it didn't. Um, one year it was futurism. I wanted to figure out how do people predict the future. Um, one year it was games. And what was really interesting to me about games is, you know, I was in my late 30s and I didn't like games. I didn't play games. I didn't play card games. I didn't play uh, board games. I didn't play video games. Um, I love baseball because you can go there with a novel and eat, drink good beer and, eat, you know, and get a tan. That was about all it was for me for games. So I thought, well, this is something that human beings really love and they really care about it. And so why are games so amazing? Um, and so what I did is I studied these people. So some of them are great game designers like Sid Meier. I found all his videos on the web. Um, some of them are actually people I worked with at uh, Zynga, like Mark Skaggs or Aaron Hoffman. Um, some are people like Amy Jo Kim, who's just in the community, and she's an amazing lady, and we'll give you her time if you track her down, if you stalk her, as we do. Um, and some of them aren't even people that you might think of as game designers, like Dan Brown, who wrote Communicating Design. Um, and through these people, I fell in love with games. I fell in love with games so hard that I joined Zynga. And, um, that was an amazing ride for pluses and minuses, but I have to say I learned more at Zynga in one year than I've learned any place beforehand, and I've worked at amazing companies like LinkedIn and Yahoo. Um, so I'd like to make this a little bit of a different kind of talk slash class. I'd like you guys to, to turn to each other, I'm afraid you're a little isolated over there, um, and introduce each other, and um, share the first game that you can remember ever playing in your life. What's the earliest game? And then explain the rules to the person next to you. Now, peekaboo, the rules are pretty simple. You cover your face, and then you see each other. And then you cover your face, and you see each other. Um, so, you know, some rules will be simple, some will be hard. So, go ahead and share with each other. So, the first thing is, you need to find your North Star. Every project needs a goal that's worth doing. So, with games, it's fun. That was one thing that really impressed me when I very first started working with game companies. And uh, since that, I've worked with a lot of independent game companies and my job as an angel and an advisor. So this wasn't just Zynga. But um, game companies won't launch until it's fun. They'll just keep going and going. They'll tweak the mechanics. They'll tweak the look and feel. Because if you launch a game that isn't fun, what happens? Never go again. Yeah, you fail. You fail very quickly. So there's no point in it. And yet sometimes I wonder, we launch things all the time because it's time to launch. We launch email because it's 11.6. You know, we launch uh, our new photo sharing, not because people now feel more connected to the people they know, but because uh, it's been 12 weeks and it's time to launch. Um, so I'm gonna share a little video. This is Brenda Braith Braithwaite. Um, her name is now Romero. Um, and it was Braithwaite when she did this. And she's gonna talk about the emotional goals of a different game. So this is my kid, this is Mesa. And when she was seven years old, she came home from school one day, and like I do every single day, I ask her, what'd you do today? So she said, we talked about the Middle Passage. Now, this was a big moment. Mesa's dad is black, and, uh, and I knew this day was coming. Um, I wasn't expecting it at seven, I don't know why, but I wasn't. Anyway, so I asked her, um, how do you feel about that? 
So she proceeded to tell me, and so any of you who are parents will recognize the bingo buzzwords here. So the ships start in England, they come down from England, they go to Africa, they go across the ocean, that's the Middle Passage part, they come to America where the slaves are sold, she's telling me. But Abraham Lincoln was elected president, and then he passed the Emancipation Proclamation, and now they're free. Pause for about 10 seconds. Can I play a game, Mommy? And I thought, that, that's it, right? Like, and so, you know, think, this is the Middle Passage. This is an incredibly significant event. Um, and she's treating it like some, basically some black people went on a cruise, is more or less how it sounds to her. Um, and so to me, I wanted more value in this. So when she asked if she could play a game, I said, yes. Um, and so I happen to have all of these little pieces. I'm a game designer, so I have this stuff sitting around my house. So I said, yeah, you can play a game. And I give her a bunch of these. And I tell her to paint them in different families. These are pictures of Mason when she was, God, it still chokes me up seeing these. So she, she's painting her little families. And then I grab a bunch of them, and I put them on a boat. Um, this was the boat. It was made quickly, obviously. Um, <laughs> And so the basic gist of it is, I grabbed a bunch of families, and she's like, Mommy, but you forgot the pink baby, and you forgot the blue daddy, and you forgot all these other things. And she says, they want to go. And I said, honey, no, they don't want to go. This is the Middle Passage. Nobody wants to go in the Middle Passage. So she gave me a look that only a daughter of a game designer would give a mother. Um, and as we're going across the ocean following these rules, she realizes that she's rolling pretty high. And she says to me, we're not going to make it. Um, and she realizes, you know, we don't have enough food. And so she asks what to do. And I, I say, well, we can either, remember, she's seven. We can either put some people in the water or we can hope that they don't get sick and we make it to the other side. And she, like, the, just the look on her face came over and she said, now mind you, this is after a month of, this is Black History Month, right? After a month, she says to me, did this really happen? And I said, yes. And so she said, so if I came out of the woods, this is her brother and sister, if I came out of the woods, Avalon and Donovan might be gone. Yes. Um, but I'd get to see them in America. No. But what if I saw them? You know, couldn't we stay together? No. So daddy could be gone. Yes. And she was fascinated by this. And she started to cry. And I started to cry. And her father started to cry. And now we're all crying. He didn't expect to come home from work to the Middle Passage. But there you go. Here's this kid. They're reading stories. My daughter just turned eight, so it's the same age. They're reading stories, they're seeing movies, and it didn't get through. It might have been Lord of the Rings and stories about orcs. Nothing got her until she had to be the person who made the choice about who got to live and die. Something interesting happens in games. You can't watch them passively. As well, was this a fun game? It was an engaging game. But I'm not sure anybody would ever call it fun. Her North Star was to create a feeling in her daughter of empathy of something that happened a long time ago. Something that happened so long ago that she couldn't even relate to it until she recreated it. That is one of the most magical things that games can do. They can simulate reality in a way that we can live it once again. So you've got to design for an emotion. This is my daughter. She's really good at emotion. She has many of them. Conversion is a crap North Star. Now, um, I love numbers. I love numbers. I love A-B testing. I've put in A-B testing in the last four companies I've worked at. But nobody gets out of bed in the morning and go, I'm making numbers go up 2% this morning. Woo, let's get to work. Like, it just doesn't get you psyched. It's lovely. Well, it gets one person I know psyched, but she's a freak. Um, in general, we really want to feel like we're making a difference in this world, that we're creating emotions that matter. So UX people have probably heard surprise and delight. We're going to create surprise and delight. Well, when I was a little kid, I had a box of eight crayons. I liked these eight crayons. They were pretty good eight crayons. Well, when I became a game designer, it was almost like when I turned 12 and got the big box. <laughs> All of a sudden, I wasn't just designing for surprise and delight. I was making people empowered or awed or mm -hmm. tickled or ecstatic, like these are a lot of amazing, amazing emotions that you can really make people feel with games. Like why are we just talking about surprise and delight all day long? That's not, that's not aiming very high in my book. So peace, peace is a wonderful emotion. A lot of people make fun of Farmville. Believe me, I know, you know, I worked at Zynga. Everybody's like, yeah, what are you doing? Cow clicking, whatever. Well, um, we interviewed a lot of these women who play, and they're mostly women, but there's some guys too. I don't want to be too genderist, but it is, largely a female game. And um, these women are at home, and I'm going to tell you, their lives are hard. The house is a mess, and they're working part-time, and the kid's on their lap. 
We used to talk about making games to play one-handed, us and porn, uh, for a slightly different reason. The kid's sitting on the lap. You have to make sure the jokes aren't too raunchy. Um, and the cat's puked on the rug, and the dishes are wet. And then you go to your farm, and your farm is perfect. Your farm is beautiful. It's peaceful. It's magical. You have control. It's a place in the world that can become your little place to go hide. Now, if this sounds weak, let's remember guys like to have places to hide also. Um, this is from a wonderful model train uh, convention that uh, happened in Iowa. That's a very boy place to go have peace and quiet and hide and rest and have a world that makes sense to you. Um, think about the container store. What do they sell? Guess what? Someday you might actually be in charge of your life. Someday you might be able to find that extra pair of keys when you're looking for it. Um, we all dream of peace and order. It's a very important emotion that we aim for. So when I see the Facebook uh, photos page, I just go, more beautiful. Photos are bigger. You can customize how they look. I'm like, is that all you got? These are my photos, man. I like to look at them over and over again. I like to lay them out in front of me. I like to put them in scrapbooks. I like to decorate them. I like to share with them. I mean, think of all the things that people do with photos. And all Facebook can think of to do is make them bigger and maybe put on a filter. Like, that seems like a waste of opportunity to capture this emotional experience that you have with photos. So let's talk about negative emotions. Once again, if you talk to most user experience designers, they'll talk about frustration. They'll t that's about all they got. Or uh, users are mad. They're frustrated and mad. Once again, we got a big box. Depressed, detached, troubled, turbulent, uncomfortable, uneasy. A nerve. I often feel unnerved on Facebook. Um, there's a lot of negative emotions. Well, why is this useful? I don't know if you've ever played this game. Does anybody not know what we're looking at? Okay. So, that, no, it's okay. This is Plants vs. Zombies. So this is a great game. <laughs> you have the zombies that are trying to get in your house. And what do you do when zombies are trying to get in your house? You well, you them. plant some plants, right? <laughs> that will fight the zombies, because that's what you do when you have zombies. No, you kill them. Well, they... The plants will kill them. They'll shoot. The, these are bombs. <laughs> these are uh, shooters. Uh, this one will freeze them. You have all these cool plants that will kill your zombies. They're too cute to kill someone. <laughs> well, these zombies are kind of cute too. <laughs> well, I don't even want to know. So you're, making, um, you're making cute things fight? That's sick. <laughs> yes, but brilliant. Cute zombies are big. Um, well, if you've ever played this game, you've seen this screen. <laughs> you know what? This is an awesome moment. <laughs> Curse you, villain! Gosh, I lost. I'll get you next time. There's like a joy. And so if you think this is anecdotal, these wonderful pace people in, um, I'm going to get it wrong, Iceland, uh, did a study, and it turns out that you have a heightened set of pleasure in that moment of loss when you've almost made it. In fact, actually successfully hitting the next level is a little bit of a letdown. You're like, okay, next, you know, cool, I knocked it. But that, that feeling of, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you next time is actually kind of an awesome emotion. And I wonder if we're not thinking enough about negative emotions. Are there things we could be doing? For example, this is a, a dating site. It's called Coffee Meets Bagel. And every day you get only one match. And if you don't sign in that day to check out your match, you never know who he might be. Um, I think you have to pay extra money to get in touch with them. And I've got to say, when I look at my bagel history, mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, yes, yeah, so. Like, there's no sense of, ah, I missed out. It's tragic. I've got to try harder. You know, obviously, knowing my dirty ways, that's probably my future husband over there. And I missed him. How could that have happened? So I wonder if there's some way they could explode this a little bit. Like, they could zoom out or they could pop or I could come in two minutes late and you could go oops almost got it like is there some way they could heighten that sense of loss to make it more intense and more more pleasurable for me so this is Dan Brown and he's pretty famous when it comes to design he's an amazing guy and he runs a small design studio and he had a really hard problem designers do not like conflict they don't like to fight they don't like to pick up trouble um, and he couldn't get them to argue um, effectively with each other to make a great design or talk to their clients about their problems. And he tried to make them role play. And they were like super uncomfortable. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm the product owner and 
I think you suck. You know, there was no energy. So he actually designed a card game in which you would get these classic problems and these solutions and you had to be creative. And there's this idea that comes from game design which is called the magic circle. And the way the magic circle is described is when you go into a play a game, you agree to do ridiculous things according to the rules of the game. Golf is often used. If you were told, take this ball and put it in the hole, and you need to do as many try, few as tries as you uh, possibly can, you would walk over and you would put it in the hole. But because it's a game, you're going to hit it with a little tiny stick instead, because that's more fun. That's the magic circle. And so what happened is, once people were trying to beat each other and win, all of a sudden they are role playing. They are using different techniques that they felt uncomfortable using. Mm -hmm. They're actually working through the conflicts that were driving them crazy beforehand. The game gave them a freedom to try on ridiculous things. And I think that's one of the greatest powers games have, is to allow you to pretend to be things you aren't and try to create the emotions you want to. So I don't know if you guys are working on projects right now, but I'd like you to talk to your groups again and say, until my players feel X, I will not ship. I'll go back to the uh, happy crayon slide here. So um, share the projects that you either just worked on, some of you are students, or you are working on, and say, what emotion do you want them to feel? So if I was working on email, I might say, until my, fee uh, my users feel uh, empowered to be in control of their life, I'm cheating, I'm using two words, I will not ship because that would be something I wish my email did for me, to be quite honest. Okay, let's talk among ourselves. Okay, are we ready to rock it? So um, I'm gonna talk next about the difference between player types and personas. So um, does anybody not know what a persona is? Okay, so in UX, we create these archetypal users that help us be empathic to our end users and keep them with us even when we can't be talking to them. And often we give them names, uh, we give them ages, we give them quotes, we give them uh, a lot of personality. It's almost like playing Barbies at work, it's very fun. Um, and UX people do this so that you can remember that uh, if I'm making a program for her, well, she can use her browser and her email and MS Word confuses her. It helps us remember uh, the issues that we have with our end user. Game designers talk about player types a lot more than personas. And what I love about player types is how do you play the game? So this was done as a study um, by Bartlett. These are Bartlett player types. And he was studying uh, moos and muds. And these are dungeons uh, online. And by dungeons, I mean we're playing Lord of the Rings. We've got hobbits, we've got thieves, we've got dragons, we're stealing money, we're killing people, all that good stuff. And so he found there were four different ways that people played these games. We had the killers. And these are the guys who will come up to you at the local pub and say, hello and they kill you dead. I mean, that's, they're just looking to create mayhem, that's all. <laughs> then we have the achievers. They'll come up to you in the pub and they'll say, how much gold you got? Yeah, I got 12 million pieces. Okay, I'm beating your ass, I'm good. Okay, as long as I have more money than you, I'm happy, right? So then we have the socialites. And you come up to them in the pub and you say, how you doing? They're going, just one sec. Okay, so Sarah had her baby. Okay, but you know, Joe is not sure if it's his. Like, they're there to just talk and be with their friends. I found out that people stayed on Ultima Online and World of Warcraft, like these types, twice as long after they stopped playing because they wanted to see their friends. They would literally log onto the game, go to the pub, hang out, chat, and get off without having killed a single hobbit. It's amazing. Um, and then the explorers, which is me, they just want to know what's around that corner. If there's an empty box, they have to open it. If there's a cave, they've got to look in it. As long as they're figuring out what everything is, they're happy. And obviously there's combinations, you know, you have killer explorers who go in the cave and find something to kill and kill it. Um, or killer, you know, achievers, explorers who look for it, look for uh, gold. But um, it's funny, um, every game designer I've ever met is an explorer, so I think that says something interesting about who they are. Well, we see a lot of gamification people trying to apply this model to everything. And so they'll create things like leaderboards, figuring out that there are some people who are achievers. So I was talking to somebody who's, I'm afraid I can't name their names, but they put a gamification system in with customer service. And the customer service people hated it because they created a leaderboard for who could answer the most calls. And they're like, that's not why I do it. I'm a customer service person because I'm here to help people. They created mechanics that didn't match how people played the game. So there are four key engagement styles 
that Amy Jo Kim came up with. She said, not only does Bartlett not apply to life, it doesn't even apply to every game. On social games, on say, Facebook for a while and now on mobile, there are these four kinds of player types. We have the expressors. These are the people you might remember from Farmville who want to show off their amazing farm. They will plant the cotton, the strawberries, and the blueberries just right so that at one moment of the day, suddenly an American flag shows up. Um, they're very interested in showing off their prowess. There's the competitors who want to have the biggest building, the biggest farm, the biggest everything, you know. Um, they don't like leaderboards. It's sort of like, I hate to be um, sexist, but there's a certain competition you may remember among middle school girls, which is, it's not explicit, but it's sort of like, yeah, that's last year's outfit. There's a little bit of that among these computers. They're sort of like, yeah, that's a cute farm. You know, there's a little coldness to it, but they don't like the explicit leaderboards. Um, there's explorers who just want to go, what's in that corner? What's over there? Can I get this new kind of macaroni tree? What will it look like when it's grown up? Um, and then the collaborators who want to get together and build something. Um, and it's like, they're a little like the quilting bee people. They want to hang out and build something together. So I asked myself, what if Amazon was a game? How do people play Amazon? So I thought, you know, they started with the satisficers, right? These are people who do not want the lowest prices. They do not want necessarily the best thing. They want something that's good enough. Satisficer is a person who just wants it to be good enough so they don't have to kill themselves trying to pick something. You know, they don't want to spend 20 hours of research. And if you think about it, if you really wanted the very best price, you would go to every site, you'd use Google. Um, if you wanted the very highest quality, you wouldn't just read Amazon's reviews, you would read everybody's reviews. But people go to Amazon, they're like, I'm getting a decent price, I'm getting a decent product, I'm good. Then there's the socializers. So this is super interesting because it evolved over time. We started with reviews, right? Every Amazon product has reviews. Well, all of a sudden people were uh, commenting on a review with another review. And because the most helpful go up, the stream got broken, so they had to add comments to reviews so people could reply to reviews. And then people would start little conversations like, you know, oh yeah, that Green Lantern sucked, but did you read this other Rebirth Green Lantern? That's a really good comic. So they created forums. So there are people on Amazon having huge conversations and making friends now because they've gotten together about the things that they love, which Amazon happens to sell. And good for Amazon, if they want to sell the next one, those people are just sitting there ready to be plucked. Um, you can't ignore optimizers on a shopping site, so they do create the gold box, which gives you a special price if you're there to catch it, so it creates the, the pleasure of the hunt for the optimizer. And I think, and this is just my theory, there are people who love self-discovery. I don't know about you, but I love going to my Amazon page and going, oh, Linda Carter was Wonder Woman, I loved her Amazon, how did you know, you know? <laughs> it just feels like a, a, a mirror back upon myself in a really sort of beautiful way through stuff. So, by the way, you'll notice these are all four squares. You might have one player type. I mean, Amazon started with Satisficers, right? You might have three, you might have six. Um, never let the form of the layout determine how many things you have. I see everybody always makes four, and I'm like, what if you had three? So uh, again, we're going to do a real quick two minutes so we get through all everything. But I'd like you, again, talk about your player types. How are people playing the app or site or project that you're working on? Okay, let's just take two minutes to talk among ourselves with our groups. So what's interesting about this is that um, achievers are winning when they're doing better than you. Killers are winning when you're losing. So what's interesting about killers is they're often the hackers. They're often the spoilers. They're often the people who use the game just to cause trouble. Um, one of my favorite stories that Randy Farmer tells was about one of the very first social versions of, I want to say it was Sims, um, that he worked on. And it was a multiplayer game. And what happened is they, a bunch of the people who were playing it turned into the Sims Mafia. And they would go around and they'd say, that's a pretty good reputation score you got there. Wouldn't want anything to happen to it. Give me some of your gold, because you couldn't do things without a reputation score. And so this group would all vote somebody down if they didn't pay up. Those are killers. That's classic killer. They just want to break the system. They just want to take you down. It's really interesting. That's why it's, um, I've even known certain game designers who will build um, things for them to destroy for their own pleasure. Like, it's like having an Australian sheepdog. You know, if you don't give them to something to chew on and run them, they'll eat your sofa. 
So if you've got killers in your system, you've got to think about something for them to do to take their energy. Um, so that's an interesting problem. So while the achievers just want to be at the top of the leaderboard, the killer could be the lowest guy on the leaderboard, and they'd look at the guy at the top of the leaderboard, and he's like, I bet I could hack him. I bet I could take him down. So they definitely have a different point of view. That's a wonderful question. Core loops are really interesting. I think they only rose in importance in game design when social games came and things were free to pay. Because if you think about it, if you're going to pay $50 for a game and take it home, you're going to play it all weekend in your console, and then when you're done, you're done. The company's made its money. You don't have to keep playing it necessarily. But if you pay like Farmville, little bit by little bit, you have to have some way to bring people back. And I think uh, game loops is one of the most powerful things for people who have websites because very often we have to get people to come back. Or apps. Uh, one of the number one problems with mobile apps, um, I'm sure Maria could share with this, is that people will install it, and if you're lucky, they open it once. And if you're really lucky and really good, they open it three times, right? I mean, it's really hard to get people to use apps more than once. So it's a huge struggle. So um, this is a core loop. You can go back to sleep, Maria. Oh. <laughs> no, she's seen this before. She's moral support tonight. Um, so this is a, a classic uh, social game loop. This is Fishville. And with Fishville, what you do is uh, you're given a few eggs to start with a fish. And they hatch, and you feed them, and you clean their aquarium. And they grow big, and you can sell them for money, and you can buy better eggs, and then you, the cycle continues. So you buy the fish, fish eggs, you grow them, and you sell them. Um, I was actually playing a version of this on my phone called Tap Fish with my daughter. I should say my daughter was playing this on the phone. And it was a time when I had to fly to LA half the week every week. I was in LA for three days, and uh, I spent a lot of money replacing dead fish. It was, I was so glad when she got bored of this game. And it took a long time, because it's a very addictive loop. Um, so this is a, a powerful thing and a dangerous thing in the wrong hands. Um, so I'm going to have uh, Will Wright, the maker of Spore and The Sims and arguably the smartest guy in game design, talk a little bit about how you can take a very, very, very simple loop and get a lot of rich gameplay out of it. It's one of my favorite clips. Where are you, Mousy? There you are, Mousy. So um, I'm going to give you just a, a very brief example of how that simplicity adds up. And this is kind of a very simple little game design, Sim War. We have three units in this game. There's a production unit that builds new units. There's an offensive unit that can go, can move and attack. That's the only one that can move. And there's a defensive unit that just kind of sits there and, you know, can defend. So um, the rules here basically is each one has a cost. The uh, defensive unit is cheaper than the offensive one. The defensive or over offensive can always defeat the factory. And those two have a 50-50 chance. And so that's the complete rule set of the game right there. And now it's just a matter of um, playing the game. And this game, actually, it's got uh, one thing that we try to get in a lot of games, it's avoiding convergent strategies, which is to say that there's no optimum strategy for playing this game. In this game, it, you know, it very much depends on what the opponent does as to what your optimal strategy is. So if we're imagining what red might do, we're playing black here. Red might build offensive units and come attack us, um, in which case our best defense would be build offensive units because they're much cheaper. On the other hand, Red might decide to go for production, in which case we're better off building offensive units and going and you know, getting them before he's built any military units. Um, Red could build offensive, in which case we'd want to build up production. So for any strategy that Red takes, there is some optimum strategy that Black can take that counters that strategy. Um, this is kind of what we generally call paper, rock, scissors for obvious reasons. Uh, at the initial stages of a game like this, there's an interesting chaotic thing where Basically, the state of the system, you know, very quickly can run to, you know, I can lose or win the game very rapidly, depending on whether I outguess my opponent or not. Um, otherwise, the game actually will start to stabilize over time. So there are kind of different dimensions to the gameplay here. Um, eventually, you end up with, you know, very elaborate kind of setups that are collapsing a lot of player decisions into a very simple structure. Um, you're dealing with things like, you know, do I go for a short-term gain by attacking, or do I go for long-term by doing production? Um, do I go for a high-risk strategy by being very offensive or a low-risk strategy by kind of mixing my units? Um, I have allocation deci you know, decisions. Which factories, you know, what will my factories build? Uh, I have priority decisions, you know, what order in which I build these things. Uh, they're kind of networks that you might actually add to a game like this. You know, how close do they have to be to support something or defend something? So in essence, um, what we've done with a very, very simple rule set is we've collapsed all this into a very interesting set of um, considerations that a player has to make to make a decision. And really, that's what games are about. Games are about 
giving a player a very rich um, decision. One of the mistakes I often see people make when they start uh, designing anything, actually not just games, but regular UX, is over-featuring. Like, it seems kind of boring, it seems kind of plain. So they keep adding more and more stuff, more leaderboards, more rewards, more points, more levels. But the reality is if you can get just a very simple, clean loop where everything goes into the next thing and the decisions are interesting, you can get a lot of richness. Um, for example, if you want to see, it's funny because he gave this talk several years ago and uh, this is one of my favorite games, it's called Backyard Monsters. You can play it on Facebook so you don't need to buy a console or anything. It's a really beautiful Facebook game and it's not too spammy or gross. And uh, you have these exact same decisions. You can defend, build defensive units to protect yourself from outside monsters who are going to attack you every so often. You can build offensive units to attack your neighbors. You're going to play against both AI, um, the computer, as well as your actual friends, if you can find any friends who are playing it, um, which is really fun to attack your friends. Um, and you, can ha you have production units which will create the monsters or will create um, basic resources that let you build the defensive and offensive. So it has that exact same richness that you just talked about, where you're building defense and offense, you're attacking, you're defending, you keep going back in over and over and over again. It's endlessly fascinating. Um, I thought about this. Can anybody tell me what uh, website this core loop might belong to? Amazon. Amazon. That's a great choice. We've been talking about Amazon. Could it be TripAdvisor? Could it be Yelp? I mean, this core loop is an incredibly powerful loop. It's used all over e-commerce on the web now. We see it again and again and again. You shop. Using reviews, you shop. You pick what you like, you buy. You're grateful or you're angry. And so you leave another review, which helps people shop. And so the loop continues over and over and over again. It's a very virtuous loop. It's hard to kickstart these, obviously. Um, in social, we talk a lot about the cold start problem. But once it's going, it's almost unstoppable. Here's another one. Every social site belongs to this one. This is Facebook. This is Twitter. Over and over again, we're, we're sharing things, we're consuming, we're reacting to them. It's a virtuous loop that will continue forever. People never get tired of this loop. Um, this is one of my core issues when I work with startups, is they get you to come on and they get you to, whatever, buy, and then they forget how to get you back in again. If you can figure out how to get people to come back one more time, I will tell you, your startup will succeed. So let's take another two minutes and uh, brainstorm for one of you guys' problems. What's your core loop? Okay? So we're going to talk about mechanics now. This is sort of the big juicy thing in game design that everybody talks about a lot. Um, so what are mechanics? Honestly, rules are mechanics. So when you guys were talking about how the game was played in the very beginning of this talk, you are actually talking through the game mechanics. It's how things work. You're probably all familiar with rock, paper, scissors. My daughter and I play this a lot when we're on boats and we're not allowed to take out electronics because they might drown. Uh, we play endless games of rock, paper, scissors, you know, and the rules are rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, paper beats rock. If you get bored with this, which my daughter may never get bored of it, um, you can move on to rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock which, you know, for layers of complexity, you know, super neutery. This is, hey, this is played at tournament levels, I kid you not. And if you, okay, so this one's for you. You can get it on a t-shirt. Impress the ladies. I know you want it. Come on. I really do want it. I have, I, that's you, isn't it? I think I recognize you. It's pretty, I want it. It's pretty awesome. So sometimes mechanics can also be constraints. At Zynga, we talked about something called pinch, and I've talked to a lot of my game design friends, and they don't call it pinch, but I think pinch is just the best word for it. Pinch is that moment where you're really into the game, and all of a sudden, ugh, you can't go forward. So you'll see this in social games. This is a game called SimSocial. Um, it is not a Zynga game. It's made by EA. And in this game, you're an ordinary person with an ordinary house, and you do things like, you know, blog and garden and use the toilet and bathe and visit friends. And eventually, you might be in the middle of writing a really brilliant blog post. No, you really can't blog in this game. Um, and you will run out of energy. And it's that moment where you're like, ah, oh, but I was just in the middle of something. Like, I want to keep playing. So you have a choice. 
If you want to keep playing, you can ask your friends for more energy, which allows the game to go viral. You can pay a little bit of money, or you can pay a whole bunch of money to get more energy so you can keep playing, or you can go away and it will naturally uh, refill over time. Um, at Zynga, we talked about the slow boat version. No matter what you ask people to do, you always had to have a free version because social games in which there's nobody, it's not very social. So there always does have to be some way to play through free, even if it's hard. Um, sometimes I thought that social games are the only place where they make money because you pay to cheat. But, you know, that's one attitude. Um, I don't like this pinch, though. It feels very unnatural. Like, why am I suddenly out of energy? I know when I'm at home and I'm writing good blog posts, I'll suddenly stop three hours later and be starving, right? You know, you're like, that doesn't feel right. So is the idea that the pinch is introduced at a specific moment in the game? Unfortunately, or the pinch is moment? often just at a, you, it takes a certain amount of energy to do things. And if I did a little gardening, a little writing, and clean my fridge, sure. I might run out halfway through cleaning <coughs> the fridge, at which point I might not mind. So in this particular case, it's actually just you have so much energy, things take so much to do, and you run out when you've done them, mm -hmm. as opposed to thoughtfully creating a moment. Um, Cityville has a different pinch. So Cityville is a game that's sort of like, um, it's a little like SimCity, but it's, it's very lightweight and playful. And you build these little neighborhoods, and you collect money from uh, the businesses, <laughs> you collect rent from the houses, and then you can build more buildings. And what happens is you run out of space. And then you're given this really sort of deliciously difficult question, which is, am I going to plow down the brownstones and create skyscrapers that'll make me more money, or do I want to expand my land? This is a wonderful pinch because it, it works within the logic of the game. It makes sense. So when you hit that pinch, it's actually nice. It's, it's a nice negative feeling. You're like, oh, I've now got to make a decision. You know, am I going to wait and save more money? Am I going to buy more land? Am I going to take out things that I love and I spend a lot of time designing? So you can see how, that's why I was speaking to your point, which is you can see how when the pinch makes sense in the logic of the game, it's not <coughs> oppressive. It's not interrupting. It makes sense. And then, this is a game called Castleville. And what's great about Castleville is it has two pinches. So one is um, you're building things, right? Just like you did in Cityville. But then you're exploring. There's all these dark areas of the forest, and every so often there's a little message from a bird that says, the wizard needs your help, he's under attack, or orcs have been sighted in the northwest boundaries. And so you can see there's two player types now. You have the, the ex self expressor who wants to build a beautiful castle and have more land, and then you have the explorer. You might even say you, you might even have a little killer if it's bad guys to kill. So um, the pinch is actually playing across multiple levels, which is really, really smart. Um, so when gamification people often talk about mechanics, unfortunately, they're frequently talking about manipulating emotions. So there are six principles of persuasion that Robert uh, Cialdini came up with. And the reciprocity, social proof, commitment and consistency, authority, liking, and scarcity. And basically, all of these will work to a certain degree. They won't work forever. But they're very effective in getting people to do things you want. You are going to see all six of these in Facebook social games. I mean, they are games that are trying really hard to get you to show up a lot and to play. And I will say, I think free to play is really bad for great games. Um, if you play Plants vs. Zombies 1 and Plants vs. Zombies 2, Plants vs. Zombies 1, is you pay once, you buy the game, you play it all the way through, it's wonderful. Plants vs. Zombie 2, there's tons of pinch and you pay a little bit and it's very interrupting. I think it could have been designed to be fun, but I don't think that's what happened. But you play it, you tell me. So reciprocity is um, this person gave you something, don't you want to give it back to them? What's really interesting is uh, what we did at Zynga is we discovered that rather than say, um, uh, Christina needs turkey legs for Castleville. They'd say, Christina gave you a turkey leg. Do you want to give her one back? And it had a much higher open rate and return action rate. So um, also people don't really like to ask for stuff. They'd rather give you something that's on back. So there's a, a social and a psychological piece too. Social proof. 
We all see face piles everywhere. This is a term from Facebook where you show all your friends, look, all your friends are playing Bubble Safari. Don't you want to play Bubble Safari? That's social <laughs> proof. Um, commitment and consistency. I don't have a, a screenshot for that, but a lot of the games have, if you've played it five days in a row, that's why I don't have a screenshot, because I haven't been playing anything five days in a row. Kind of, I'm kind of grateful. I feel like I'm detoxed a little. But um, you know, you get a little more points each time. It'll say, congratulations, you've played every day. And people actually have a feeling like, hey, I, I'm doing well. I'm playing Bubble Witch every day. Um, obviously, it could backfire on you if you decided playing every day was a bad thing. But often people like to feel they're internally consistent. There was a large study done that showed that um, if you had people put a uh, board on their front yard that said, get out and vote, those people were much more likely to vote because they felt like they couldn't, they had to be internally consistent with the message that they had in their front yard. So it's the same thing. Psychologically, we don't like to disagree with ourselves. Authority. Um, this means somebody in power is telling you you should do this. Um, celebrity endorsements are actually based more on authority than liking. Um, if we see somebody famous or rich, Donald Trump, even if we don't like them, we kind of have feel like they have a weight of power. And the most famous version of this is, of course, the um, Milgram shock experiments, where there was somebody on their side of the glass, and you were told to push a button and give them a shock. And as long as there was somebody in a white lab coat behind you saying, push the button, they would keep doing it, even though the person was writhing on the floor in pain. It was the most horrifying thing ever. Um, it explains a lot of what, what happened in Abu Ghraib and uh, the Nazi camps as well. Um, if you ever want to dig deeper into this, uh, I believe the book is called, actually it's Philip Zimbardo, and it's called The Satan Principle. It's amazingly horrifying. We all have a little seed of something inside us, and it's better that we be aware of it. Liking. Liking is a really simple one. If there's a good looking person with a sweet babyish face, we, uh, as humans, like kittens and babies, um, we're more likely to do what that person is telling us. Um, it makes me wonder about this choice of the chimp. <laughs> Not sure I would have gone that way. Those zombies are cute. Um, and of course, scarcity. We all know scarcity. Um, scarcity is when you think you're going to run out of things. And so that's what makes the gold box so incredibly powerful, is on the gold box, we're told that you missed this one, it's expired. But this one's available, but there's only one hour, two second, two, what, one hour, two minutes, and 27 seconds remaining. And so it's gonna be gone soon. Quick, you better get it, you better get it. Uh, we get very excited when we think we're gonna run out of things. So achievements. This is the number one thing that when people go to gamify things, you know, we've all heard badges. We don't need no stinking badges, badges everywhere. Those are basically achievements. That's sort of the meta word the game designers use. So I think there's a lot to be said for achievements. I think we should be celebrating micro wins. So once again, here we are in SimSocial. There I am blogging in my underwear, like I do, you know. And um, if I manage to do everything I need to do to keep my life in order, like I've visited my friends, and I've done things I like, and I've eaten food, and I've washed, and I've used the toilet, um, I have no idea what that is, um, then all of a sudden I'm inspired, and I'm happy, and everything I do gets double points, and I'm joyful. And to be honest, considering I can almost never get the state in my real life, it's very exciting to get it in the game as well. Um, and what will happen is something that uh, was invented at Zynga by Brian Reynolds, and it's called Dubers. And what happens is when these little moments of everything coming together, um, the stars pop out, and there's like a nice casino ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching sound. And that's exciting, and it's pleasurable, and it's fun. You're like, woo, I made it. Um, I look at Google, and if you use Gmail, you know you have important and unread, and things you've starred, and then all the other three million mails you have. In this case, oh, thank God it doesn't say it's like 3,000 for me. Um, and <laughs> even though I know I will never empty out my main inbox, I have hopes and dreams occasionally <laughs> of emptying out important and unread. And when I do, Google says, woohoo, you've read all the important messages in your inbox. Google, <laughs> I've done so much. Is this all you have for me? I want to celebrate. I want casino sounds. I want stars pouring out. It's exciting. It's a big deal. I don't know why we're so shy in our celebrations. I was helping Nathan Bradshaw uh, work on Dash, the new uh, tool to help people learn how to code. And when they complete a unit, 
you now have check marks like raining down. That, that would be me. Because we should celebrate. You know, life needs more celebrations. And that's what games know, and that's what we should know. Leaderboards. Oh, leaderboards. So, there are two kinds of leaderboards. There are stranger leaderboards, and there are social leaderboards. Stranger leaderboards is when you're trying to compete against a bunch of different people that you don't, you may or may not know. Social leaderboards only do it with your friends. Um, social leaderboards are really compelling. Like, I see Mark sitting here, and I'm like, all I can think about is when I can displace him. I have to kick his ass. Um, it's very, very powerful. It's fun. I'll send him, like, I am going, dude, you're going down. I'm taking you next cycle. You know, it's, it's, it's fun, right? It's personal. Um, the only problem is that sometimes you don't know anybody in the system. So this was civilization, social, which they tried to get off. And unfortunately, the leaderboard is me, 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 and me. I have every position in this civilization. That's me mm -hmm. in the classes. Um, so that's the downside of social leaderboards. If nobody, and that was the problem with Dash, is uh, nobody knew each other in the system. So the question was, how do you do a leaderboard effectively? Eventually, he ended up pulling it down. And there's a good reason for it. So leaderboards can be very powerful to get people going in the very beginning. Um, Dig did it in the very beginning. They had to pull it down because it was so abused. Um, I told you about the Sims Mafia. Um, that has been shown to happen over and over again. What happened with Dig is everybody would dig their friends, ones up. So there was sort of a mafia on Dig who decided what would be on the front page. Here on Amazon, they had top reviewers, the people who had the most best reviews. You'd think that the best part would keep it from being hacked, right? Well, my friend Josh Porter said for Harriet Clauser to be number one, she'd have to read seven books a day every day. This is the moment where you go, something, something might be up here. I mean, maybe she reads really fast and writes really fast, or she's, you know, buying, uh, I don't know, papers off the internet or something. Um, so what Amazon did is he, they created a Hall of Fame reviewers. I don't know, because I don't work there, I don't know if they build a trigger to move people over here, but Harriet's still here, you know, maybe she's a killer, and if they crossed her, maybe she would create a new name and try to get at the top of the leaderboard. So instead, they created a special place so she can keep seeing her beautiful name at the top. Um, but she's no longer in the top reviewer rankers, rankings. And that's another problem that happens with leaderboards is sometimes you can never get to the top because the people who are the best are so far ahead of you, you can never catch up with them. So leaderboards have a lot of negative social consequences um, unless there's real social. What's nice about the social leaderboards is um, if Mark was way at the top all the time, which he often is, I will go over to him and go, dude, what are you doing? Like, have you got a hack? Have you got a bot? What's up with that? You know, people will keep each other honest when they know each other. But you will screw strangers. That's just a simple reality. <clears throat> this is crafting. So Minecraft, right, is crafting. You're building worlds, you're building buildings. Um, Castleville decided they were gonna add crafting to their uh, game. And so what would happen is you harvest, just like in Farmville, things like, you know, corn, chickens, pepper, tomatoes. And when you harvest enough, you could hit make, and then you come back three hours, and you would have made the, 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 what is this, chicken and corn chili. And if I made it 10 times, I would be an expert in making it. Well, I have to say this is very unsatisfying. All I am is an expert in clicking buttons. Clicking buttons does not feel like a skill. I don't feel like I'm getting better. What makes achievements powerful is when they're connected to real progress, even if it's silly progress. So this is Bubble Witch Saga. Bubble Witch Saga is a classic match three. You take bubbles and you shoot them, and if you shoot a bubble, they fall off and eventually you clear the board. And after a while, you know, you get better at aiming, you get better at choosing the right bubbles to shoot, and you have a sense of progress. Um, it even encourages you to play it a second and third time. Here's my next target. Here's the best I've ever done. I should try to beat myself. This is the most useless skill in the whole world. Like, why do I care about being awesome at shooting bubbles? But trust me, I was shooting bubbles on the train in today. I'm really into shooting bubbles. Because I love the feeling of getting better at it. I love getting more stars. I love the sense of progress. I love the celebrations. So if you compare, I clicked 40 times and I get a badge. Whatever. But I get better. I feel I'm better at something. Even if it's something that's silly, 
I have a sense that I'm progressing. And I often wonder about tools like this. So I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is the Fitbit Flex. So it has sent me, when I first got it, it had a goal of 10,000 um, steps. The first day I met 10,000 steps, this thing's great, it's like Vegas. It goes back and forth, it vibrates, lights up. My daughter's always excited to hit 10,000 steps. You know what? I've had it for six months. My goal is still 10,000 steps. They're not encouraging me to beat my own record. They're not encouraging me to get better. If Fitbit, which has a, a nice iPad interface, did something like this, next, next target, best day ever, I might be encouraged to take the steps a little more often. I might try to get better. Games are good at making you want to get better. They're good at showing you how far you've come. <clears throat> this is a very powerful tool. So just a couple other small things as our evening progresses. Oh, we're doing good. Art from the start. We, in web and applications, treat designers like flip this house. I don't know if you've ever seen the show. I do love the show. They take some skanky, sad, old house that's on the market. They pay $20,000 for it. They put a new coat of paint, a nice new toilet, always get a new toilet, always get a new bathtub, and maybe a new fridge, and then they sell it for $100,000. Well, we treat designers like we're playing Flip This website. Like, we take something that's all skanky and the usability is weird and it's not well thought out, and we ask them to make it pretty, make it nice. This is not how you make great products. In game design, what they do is they start with an artist day one. In fact, a core game design team might be a game designer, what they call an artist, the person who did the visual look and feel, and an engineer. And those three guys will sit together, girls, will sit together and they'll brainstorm together. And the artist may just go, you know, okay, well, let's do this or let's do this. And then the game designer might say, hey, I kind of like these halos. Maybe I'll add something that you can collect that will float above it and then it'll protect you and they'll go back and forth. You know, they'll come up with um, brainstorms and ideas and the design really captures the mood, the rhythm and, and everything. Um, the same with uh, even this cartoon, like, you know, um, is it gonna be playful? Is it gonna be fun? Is it gonna be serious? Is it gonna be catty? You're gonna have uh, customizable avatars. Um, baking the aesthetics in from the day creates a more coherent game. And I don't see why we don't do that with everything. Like, if we have a visual designer there sitting with us, when we're creating the next email program or the word processing program, it's gonna have a mood, it's gonna have a poetics. Right now, I have four different word processing uh, programs on my iPad. One is just like Microsoft Word. It's super powerful, it's got track changes and everything. Another one has snowy trees in the background and plays a little chime every so often. Um, um, it's called Ohm Writer. It's supposed to be a quiet place where I can do my artist pages. Another one's called IA Writer. It's got Core Courier New and a picture of Virginia Woolf and quotes from great writers. I mean, the mood changes how I write. It matters. It's not something you tack on later. So, learn how to teach. This is another great lesson from game design. One of the things I noticed about game design is, I don't know how many games you guys played, but they're all different. All the controls are different. Like if, you, if, if Web did that, you'd be screaming like, what does the link look like on this page? Why are the buttons like stars and they're hidden? So every game has to teach you how to, how to play it, quite literally. Every game has to teach you what the interface is like. So in Bubble Witch Saga, this is my bubble game, they only give you a couple instructions on the first level. All they say is, move your finger back and forth and click to hit this. That's all they teach you on the first level. Very simple. Then later they say, hey, you've only got this many shots. They're giving you the instructions in tiny bite-sized pieces so you can learn how to play while playing. So you're not having to go through 50 tutorial slides waiting for the actual work to start. It's much smarter. This is Tiny Wings. And what they do here, this is a racing game. And so you, the bird needs to be on the ground when you're going downhill to pick up speed, and then you lift it to go up. It's got a little physics thing. It's confusing. But the one thing you, so it's hard to teach, right? And what they do is on the first couple levels, they light up your finger every time you should be pushing it. And then a little bit later, they take the finger off. You don't even notice the finger's been removed. It's like training wheels for the app. It just deadly, deadly teaches you the rhythm of the game, and then after that, you can play. By the way, this is an awesome game. I love Tiny Wings. You should have it on your phone, because you can play it for hours. 
You won't even mind long gro grocery uh, lines after this game. <coughs> so this is Dance Central. It's another of my favorite games. It's a Kinect game for the Xbox. For Evolution, you know, you've got the, the square and you have to hit the squares. Well, in this game, because it's reading your entire body, you actually have to learn to dance to a certain degree. So you're trying to match the moves on the screen. So you're doing, you know, swipes and talk about it, talk about it, you know, talk about it, talk about it. And some really weird things with your hips that I can't keep seem to hit, right? Um, but you have to learn these moves. And what's interesting is Ubisoft, the people who made this, um, brought in dance instructors to teach their least coordinated engineers how to dance so they could see how it was taught. So because you're going to try to match this guy, and that's how I'm going to get my points, I have to learn the moves, which could be boring, except they put a game inside the game. So when you sit to try to learn this move, you have to do it three times to move on. Or I could look at this, go, hmm, OK, can I figure this one out? OK, and I'll try to get it just right the very first time. And if I do, I get this diamond. And then I have to do it three times. So it becomes like a little challenge. So instead of boringly having to learn how to dance, I'm gaming the game, which is so smart. Like everything could become play if you just think about it right. In fact, Plants vs. Zombies was so determined to have the game teach you to play that if you hit help, this is what you get. Help versus Plants and Zombies game. When the zombies show up, just sit there and don't do anything. You win the game when zombies get to your house. This help section brought to you by the zombies. <laughs> so if you work hard and you do a great job, maybe you also can replace your help section with a joke. Um, it's a dream we could all aim at. But uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful video out there I highly recommend you get, which is uh, how I got my mom to play through Plants vs. Zombies, where he talks about how to teach people plays. I can't even touch it. It's so awesome. Um, so the other thing I noticed about game companies is they test way more with users, with real users, than any UX person, any web company, any app company I've ever seen in my entire life. They play test like they mean it. So for example, with a project I was working on at Zynga, first um, the core team played every single day. Like you just stop and you play whatever you've got. Like that could be pieces of paper. You might be actually moving around pieces of paper to see if the rules work. Then a little bit later, you ask other people, come play my game. Then you get in the rhythm of every Friday, everybody on the team stops, runs whatever build, plays the game. Then every Friday, um, other teams come and play your game. And then a little bit later, the entire company drops everything, and the entire company plays. And meanwhile, they're also bringing outside users in every single Friday. So not only are you dogfooding it, you have outsiders. And you just know, Friday, there's going to be humans in here, and they're going to be playing period. You just get in that rhythm. And I will tell you, the things you learn are completely different. This is a wonderful um, invitation. You are cordially invited to tell me why I suck, bring a friend, respect <coughs> and serve. This is the philosophy of game design. Um, so why would you have people come in every Friday? You'd think after a while you're not learning anything new. Well, Sid Meier, master of civilization, one of the great game designers of ever, will tell you about what he learned when he did game testing. My background is in mathematics and science and programming, and I think of myself as a logical person. Um, and what we did in Civ uh, Revolution was we would show you before a battle what the, uh, what the odds were. Uh, in this example, um, our attacker here has a, a 1.5, and the, uh, the defender, the barbarians, have a, a 0 0.5. Um, they, they would have a 1. The barbarians are basically 1. But since they're uncivilized, they take a 50% penalty for that. So they're only 0 0.5. And part of, the, part of the fun of being a designer is kind of throwing those little things into the game, you know, uncivilized, minus 50%. <sighs> take that. Uh, so in this case, as a mathematician, this would be a 3 to 1 battle. 1 1.5 to 2.5. To, to you know, 3 to 1, the attacker should win three times, the, the defender should win one time out of four. Uh, very clear, very simple. You know, that's what mathematics says, that's the way it should work. Um, that's not the way our players saw it. Um, basically, at a certain point, players feel they are going to win the battle. And um, they would come to me and said, you know, I had this battle, it was three to one, 
And I lost. I was like, well, yeah, you know, three to one. Uh, you're going to lose every once in a while. I said, no, no, you don't understand. It was three to one. Three. Three is big. One is small. I, I had the big number. I sh- you know, shouldn't, I, shouldn't I have won? So I realized, okay, there's something going on here. Um, so we adjusted our system um, by actually breaking the battle up into kind of more atomic little battles to make the, the results come out more uh, than the player expected. Um, and then I watched some more players playing, and um, this time the player had, had won against three. The player had won, the little tiny one, and the, the, the AI had the big gigantic three. Um, and I watched, and, and lo and behold, the player won the battle. And I said, doesn't that feel wrong to you? That, that, that you with your little tiny one won against the huge three? And they said, no, doesn't feel wrong at all. Uh, I had, you know, clever tactics and strategy, clean living, it, it all adds up to me winning. Uh, so we realized that something was going on there psychologically that isn't exactly mathematics. I'm not sure what it is, but it's not mathematics. So we made a few adjustments and I said, okay, now now are you happy with uh, the way combat works? And we found that there is this point, and it's kind of around three to one, four to one, where people do expect to pretty much win every time. So, 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 okay. We said, okay, that's fine. We can can live with that. Um, Anything else, you know? They said, well, there's just one little thing. Um, I'm okay, you know, here's a two-to-one battle. Are you okay with, you know, winning most of the time, but every now and then losing a two-to-one? The player said, yeah, 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 you know, two-to-one, I'm I'm, I'm okay with that. Two-to-one, I should should win most of the time, but every now and then I can lose. I said, okay, good. Um, So what's your problem? Well, I had this 20-to-10 battle. And I lost. It was 20 to 10. I said, yeah. 20 to 10. I had 10 more than the 10. I had 20. But isn't that, I said, you know, isn't that 2 to 1? 20 to 10? No. That's 20 to 10. <laughs> That's a whole different, whole different odds than 2 to 1. Okay. Uh, so we, um, we actually adjusted, you know, okay, that I can see you have 10 more, so that's a lot. Okay, cool. Okay, so now, you know, made the adjustment, gave the game back. Now are you happy? Well, kind of, but let me tell you what happened. I had this two-to-one battle, and I lost, which is okay. You know, we've had this discussion. I understand now that every now and then I'm going to lose a two-to-one battle. But right after that, I had another two-to-one battle, and I lost again. How can that be? How how can I lose two two two-to-one battles? I mean, one, I can understand. The computer's out to get me, obviously. Um, Okay, so we actually take into account the results of previous battles uh, now when we do our our combat calculations. And um, then the player was very happy. Um, and, the, and we don't really do this just to make the player happy, but it's really uh, um, when, when something happens in a battle like this that, that feels wrong, we, we start to lose that suspension of disbelief. The player comes out of the game. So you can imagine that if Sid Meier treated this game the same way we treat all our web and our app projects, we do a little research up front, we do a little usability test, we do the second usability test, and then we're done, assuming we did that much. Could you got your head around this? This only came out of talking to the user and playing with them and fixing it and changing it until it felt exactly right. Um, it makes a difference to have people come in over and over and over again and work with your app until it feels right. You might get there very quickly, or sometimes there's just little things that are psychologically unexpected. We can't get into our user's head. And I love this story because it really showed what happened. And civilization, as you guys probably know if you're game fans at all, is one of the best-selling, most important games of all time. You know, uh, It's a fantastic game. It's hours of fun. You can get it on your iPad. I'm going to ruin all your free time and possibly your productivity just by giving you games to play. It's a really tremendous game. It's very, very simple and very, very elegant in its design. 
So you have to know how people think. So because I'm a teacher, I like to give out homework. I love this game. It's only $5 in your iPad. You can also get it on your PC. I think there's a console version. I love Bastion. I love this game. It's a wonderful game. I would love to recommend you guys play it. And as you play it, I want you to ask yourself about these things we just talked about. What's the North Star? What is that emotion that you feel? And I will tell you, towards the end, there's this moment everybody who's played it talks about. It's like, oh, you're tearing my heart out of my chest. Like, trust me, there's an amazing emotion you will feel if you get far enough. What are all the other emotions you feel? Triumph, disappointment, despair, betrayal. You can write a lot of emotions playing this game. Who are the player types? Are there killers? Are there explorers? What's the core loop? What gets you to reopen it over and over and over again? How did you learn to play? How did they teach you how to find the weapons? How did they teach you to find them out? Especially remember that on that very first time you play, look for how the game is teaching you how to use the game. And how does the art and music shape the game? And let me tell you, the art and the music on this game is a huge part of the game. In fact, you can buy the soundtrack to this game because it's so beautiful. It's an amazing game. So I would say it's $5 well spent. I mean, you think about it, you could spend $5 to watch Ender's Game and have a lot of fights with your gay friends about how you're morally dubious, or you could spend $5 on this game and get like 50 hours of pure fun without anybody uh, questioning your ulterior motives. Um, <laughs> Now you know how I spend my life weekend. Um, and so, yeah, this is me. I'd love to ask questions about, answer questions about any questions you guys have because I know there's a bunch of gamification questions. So let's, let's talk. <laughs>